10 years of war in Yugoslavia. Four million people lose their homes. More than 100,000 lose their lives. The atrocities horrify the world. We were very, very unprepared for the extent of the violence and the extent of the political chaos that was approaching very, very rapidly. For 35 years, the dictator Tito appeared to hold different ethnic groups together. But just behind the facade, conflicts simmered. So if you saw a flare-up of nationalism in Serbia, Tito would get rid of it. If you saw it in Croatia, brutally repress it. And this was how the balance was kept. After Tito's death, old hatreds flare up, pitting neighbor against neighbor. There was always an element of friction. The question is, when does that mixture of collective identity become antagonistic? When does it feel threatened? And historically, this has always been a pattern. How did Yugoslavia become a powder keg? And who can guarantee that the Balkans don't explode again? May 1980, an entire country stands still. With Tito's death, Yugoslavia loses its leading figure. People from all Yugoslav republics travel to Belgrade to say goodbye. There were tears, there were spontaneous outbursts of uh, public grief, and then there was the fear of what would the future bring the leader of the partisans becomes a legend during the Second World War and a fateful figure for a torn region. For many Balkan people, he's the Great White Hope. He was handsome, he was likable, he had blue eyes that fascinated people, and he had the rare gift to win people over to generate confidence, make the future tangible, and to lead people in a particular direction. Josip Broz comes from a Croatian farmer's family. A trained locksmith, he finds no work in his home country and moves to Austria and later to Germany. After the First World War, he joins the communists in Russia and makes a career in the party. Broz also gives himself the battle name Tito. After victory over Hitler's Germany in 1945, he begins to write a new chapter in Balkan history. Where we really saw him uh, elevated to the superstar was after the war, where all Yugoslavs were looking for peace and stability, and he was the one who was able to offer it. Tito wants to create a new country that will peacefully unite the Balkans. Tito's future state contains six republics with five nations and a lot of national minorities. They have two alphabets, Cyrillic and Latin, and speak many different languages, among them Serbo-Croat with its many dialects, Slovene, Macedonian, and Albanian. And they follow four different religions, Serbian Orthodox, Catholic, Muslim, and Jewish. These differences become increasingly pronounced with the question, who holds the authority in such a conglomerate state? That's a problem that weaves through the entire history of Yugoslavia until its fall. Tito's country is a patchwork of peoples, with centuries of conflicts between them. 
two great powers struggle across generations to keep the Balkans under control. The Ottomans conquer the southern territories. The House of Habsburg, later on Austria and Hungary, reach for the north. The eastern edge of the Balkans falls under the Russian Empire's field of dominance. Serbs, Croats, and Slovenians become pawns on a geopolitical chessboard. The result is a torn region, full of disputes and resentments between neighbors. The topography of the territory and the history of the three great empires kind of overlap with each other so that we have a ragged, ethnically and religiously divided map. The largest ethnic group are the Serbs. But more than a third of them lives outside of Serbia. In Bosnia, for example, around 40% of the inhabitants are Serbs. They rebel against the reigning Danubian monarchy, in the capital, young nationalists kill the Austrian presumptive heir to the throne and his wife in the summer of 1914. The assassination becomes the trigger for the First World War. It ended with Serbia victorious on the side of the Allies and the Croatian-Slovenian Habsburg lands facing invasion from Italy, another ally, uh, and so turning to Serbia for protection. So we got a marriage, not on ideal terms, not the Yugoslavia of the dream of the self-determination proponents, but a Yugoslavia dominated by the Serbian kingdom. The kingdom of Yugoslavia unites all southern Slavs in one country for the first time, Serbs, Croats, Slovenians, Bosnians, Montenegrins, and Macedonians. And in this state, the Serbs had supremacy. They had the monarchy, the royal house. The Serbs were also overrepresented in the army and the administration. And that's why the non-Serbian nationalities have always complained about living under Serbian dominance. The kingdom is from the very beginning seen as a Serbian project as opposed to a Yugoslav project. In 1929, a far-right Croatian organization forms to oppose the Serbian monarchy. They call themselves the Uprising, Ustasha, and want Croatian independence. In 1934, the terror group gets its chance to strike. Serbian King Alexander I travels to Marseille in France for a state visit. Together, they discuss how to face the fascist alliance of Hitler and Mussolini together. 2,000 policemen protect the royal platoon during their trip through the city. And yet, a lone gunman slips through and shoots Alexander I down in front of running cameras. The assassination was organized jointly by Croatian Ustasha nationalists and Macedonian revolutionary nationalists, uh, and in a sense was a mark against this attempt to create a Yugoslavia. Shortly before his death, the king says, protect Yugoslavia for me. But the assassination stokes hatred between the ethnic groups. It was accompanied by the growth of radical nationalism, particularly amongst the Croats, also amongst the Macedonians. And this was going to pave the way for uh, a really terrible, terrible train of events. During the Second World War, the Ustasha are supported by Germany and Italy. The Axis powers conquer Yugoslavia and divide it amongst themselves. In Croatia, they install a fascist state led by Ustasha founder Ante Pavlic. As a law student, Pavlic had been spokesman for a Croatian national movement. And in 1929, he founded the radical Ustasha in Italian exile. In 1941, he takes over government, Croatian independence by grace of Hitler. Without military backup from the Italians, and especially from the Germans, that is, the Wehrmacht, the Ustasha would not have been worth mentioning. Pavlic wants a greater Croatia with no room for other ethnic groups. He issues racial laws, 
Jews and Roma are systematically annihilated. The Serbs are chased, expelled, or murdered. Well, the first group who Pavlic targeted were the Serbs. So he had a policy of a third Serbs should be expelled, a third of the Serbs should be killed, and a third should be converted from orthodoxy to Catholicism. Following the German example, Pavlic has around 40 concentration camps built, where so-called enemies of the Croatian race are murdered. The largest one is Jasenovac. In the last week of the war, the Ustasha demolished the whole camp. A memorial now stands on its former grounds. Six of Ivo Goldstein's family members died in Jasenovac. There were no gas chambers like in the death camps of the German SS. The Ustasha killed with knives, hammers, or axes. For one, they killed in such a primitive way to save munition. But another reason was there was a settlement area right next to the camp. The people living there would have heard each gunshot. The methods of the Ustasha simply made less noise. The death camp was located next to a train line from Belgrade to Zagreb. The Ustasha brought their prisoners to Jasenovac in cattle cars. In transport, hunger, thirst, heat, and exhaustion already cost a third of them their lives. Especially Jewish women and children brought in from Dakovo died by scores in wagons like these. They didn't even reach the destination where they were supposed to be killed. The full tally of casualties from this genocide was a point of contention for decades between Serbs and Croats. It is now considered safe to say, in Jasenovac alone, the Ustasha killed more than 80,000 people. Several resistance groups rise up against the fascist occupying forces and their Croatian henchmen. Among them, the Chetniks, Serbian volunteers who fight for the old monarchy and an ethnically pure Greater Serbia. Their leader is Colonel Drasha Mihailovic, whom the king, living in exile in London, has appointed Minister of War. The most powerful group are the partisans, led by Josip Broz, Tito. 80,000 fighters. More and more volunteers join them. The partisans fight against the Axis powers, and at the same time, against the Ustasha and the Chetniks. Eventually, even the USA and England, who had first helped the Chetniks, come to support them. Who's killing more Germans? And the answer was Tito and the partisans were doing that. So despite the fact that Tito was a communist, the British and the others put their support behind Tito and the partisans because they were the ones really fighting and leading the struggle against Nazi Germany. And you have stories of people running off as children to go and fight with the partisans. So there was something that was romanticized about it in this terrible war-like setting. And then I think it was also people were motivated by the leaders, particularly in Serbia, of let's fight, let's defend. Time and again, the Germans, Italians, and Ustasha try to neutralize Tito. But the guerrilla leader survives every attack. And his army becomes the strongest force in the multi-ethnic state, in a conflict that borders on chaos. More than one million people lose their lives during the Second World War there, as many as in England, France, and Italy combined. Many die at the hands of their neighbors. Montenegrins were involved, Albanians were involved, Macedonians. There wasn't a single ethnic group that wasn't involved in some sort of fighting, either against the occupying power or um, settling local disputes. 
Still during the war, Tito becomes president of a provisional government. He meets with leaders of the anti-Hitler coalition and cleverly plays the East and the West against each other. For Tito has plans of his own. In October 1944, the Soviet army rolls through Belgrade. With the help of their big communist brother, the peoples of Yugoslavia are freed from fascism. Above all, the people celebrate their victorious partisan leader, Josip Broz Tito. In 1945, he becomes prime minister and Yugoslavia a federal republic. Tito's new state declares recognition of six constituent republics. Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, and Macedonia. Vojvodina and Kosovo are defined as autonomous provinces of Serbia. The choice of official language is left to the individual regions. This combination of six sovereign states under communist rule was never intended to work in, in one sense because as communists they believed the state would wither away. Tito's Federal People's Republic is a ruse. The capital Belgrade is in Serbia. The governing communist party inherits Serbian dominance in the country as well. Tito wants an independent Balkan policy and even a federation of states. Before he infects other countries in Stalin's sphere of influence, the Kremlin moves to exclude Yugoslavia from the Communist World Organization in 1948. Now, Yugoslavia wants to establish a new socialism, a third way between Western capitalism and the Soviet planned economy. Tito was up until this point seen as by far the most loyal Stalinist supporter uh, amongst the East Europeans. Now, this was a huge rupture, very, very dramatic event for communists all over the world. Yugoslavia invests in infrastructure and successfully transitions from an agrarian economy to an industrial state. Tito's socialism grants the workers participation in decision-making in production, export, and working hours, even in salary. This shift is made possible with massive support from the West, especially the USA. I, I will take this, take this opportunity to express my greetings and plenty best wishes to America's people, to all them in America who understand our difficulties, our No, 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 no. Uh, uh, aspir aspir aspirations to creating, to create a happy, new, strong Yugoslavia. Immediately after the war, he settles scores with former opponents. Tito has tens of thousands of royalists and nationalists sentenced to long prison terms or death. But as head of state, he keeps his moves out of public view. He had his staff of people who did the dirty work for him, the Secret Service chief and the army. He seldom got his hands dirty. He always came across as the good one, the one who kept the balance. After his break with Stalin, his radical purge targets all Moscow loyal party members and critics. Many of them disappear without a trace. This wasn't a Democrat. Tito was a communist. He wanted to get rid, marginalize, and have control. The Croatian island Goli Otok carries Yugoslavia's darkest secrets. Radovan Hrast is 88 years old and still returns frequently to the place where he had been banished for three years, without accusation or trial, only because of a small but disastrous comment. 
I had said as a young man in navigation school, I love Tito and Stalin, but I don't know who is more important. That already was too much. He had even fought in Tito's Liberation Army as a boy, and he will never forget the camp commander's very first words. He said, I am very sorry that it is former partisans, former communists, and fighters that are standing before me. But you have betrayed your home country. You have betrayed Tito and the party. Goli Otak translated The Naked Island. Upon arrival, Radovan Rast gets an immediate taste of what awaits him here. Right on the shore, a bloody ritual greets him. All newcomers have to pass through a long gauntlet of fellow prisoners that beat them in a blind rage. So we had to run, and the ones who ran the fastest got less of a beating. But if you were slow, you were beaten even more. That was the beginning of our re-education on Goliotok. Even when an older prisoner lost his glasses, nobody would help him. They would even step on the glasses to break them, so that he would wander around like a blind person. The prisoners cynically call the island Tito's Hawaii. 22 cell blocks with up to 130 inmates each in an everyday life of degradation, despotism, and violence. The daily forced labor in the stone quarries makes many of them collapse in exhaustion. Weakness is mercilessly punished. They beat me up so badly that I wasn't able to open my mouth for 12 hours. They had kicked out my teeth, my ears were bleeding, my hair torn out. But I told myself, now I am happy. I won't be able to work for a month. Rost is one of the last living witnesses of Tito's terrors in Yugoslavia. Until 1956, the dictator has 16,000 so-called enemies of the state banned to Goliotok. The island remains a prison until three years before Yugoslavia's fall. Tito forms the Yugoslavia National Liberation Army out of the former partisan unions, the fourth largest army in Europe. Most of the soldiers are Serbs. Almost all of the high military ranks are occupied by Serbian officers. At the beginning of the People's Liberation War, most of the partisans were Serbs. They rose to high ranks, which they kept after World War II, with leading positions in the Yugoslavian National Liberation Army as well. After the break with Stalin, the USA also willingly supplies military aid to the Yugoslavs. New cargoes, this time shiploads of modern weapons, began reaching Yugoslav ports. As far as the Americans were concerned, this break in the communist world was a tactical advantage, and they weren't going to see Tito slip back to the, uh, to the Soviet side. Ein seltener Blick durch den eisernen Vorhang, dort, wo er vielleicht ein nicht unwesentliches Loch hat. Truppenmanöver in Yugoslawien unter persönlicher Leitung von Marshal Tito. After Stalin's death, the relationship with the Soviet Union thaws. But Tito shows no interest in returning to the Eastern Bloc. While the Cold War intensifies, he reaffirms Yugoslavia stays neutral. Belgrad. In der Stunde weltweiter Gefahr für den Frieden trafen sich in der jugoslawischen Hauptstadt die Vertreter einer dritten Kraft zwischen Ost und West. Tito initiates a new movement, the Organization of Non-Aligned States, an alliance of two dozen countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. 
And so Yugoslavia's prestige around the world was suddenly elevated beyond all measure compared to the size and the influence of the country. Tito's empire experiences an economic miracle with the highest rate of growth worldwide. Incomes rise. In the West, Yugoslavia is quickly seen as a model country for liberal socialism. Surveys suggest this also strengthens solidarity in the country. In 1964, almost three quarters of citizens call their relationship to other ethnic groups good. 8% call it satisfactory, and only 5.3% bad. The rest is undecided. Some nationalities are linked to one another by family ties as well. Although there were significant differences, the Serbs and the Croats, for example, often intermarried. Two ethnicities that practically never intermarried were the Serbs and the Kosovo Albanians. The Yugoslav identity was not a fiction. It was something that was forged after the Second Year World War, and to a degree it worked, but it was, of course, dependent upon the one-party state and Tito's iron fist of control. Unlike other Eastern Bloc countries, Tito's citizens enjoy freedom of travel. Conversely, Yugoslavia is open for every foreigner, especially the almost 2,000-kilometer-long Adriatic coast in Croatia, which develops into a big source of income in the 1960s. Yugoslavia becomes one of the most popular destinations for tourists from Western Europe and North America. In 1965, three million Western tourists come to the Adriatic. In 1970, it's almost five million. At the end of the 1980s, the number doubles to 10 million. The little municipality of Tisnu on the island Murter at the coast of Dalmatia. In the early 1960s, Nikola Pavic's father is a pioneer of local tourism. He opens guest rooms in his house as more and more foreigners come to the area. It's a lifeline for him and many others who imitate him. Because agriculture is no longer enough to feed a family, and jobs only exist in the big cities. Lots of people emigrated. They fled by sea to Italy, or search for work further away, many even in Australia or Canada. Today, I have more relatives with the name Pavic in Australia than here in Chisno. Tourists don't notice the rising inflation. Time and again, the government allows the dinar to be devalued to keep prices stable. Tito has had his own holiday home since the 1950s. The island Brioni is an isolated paradise on the coast of Istria, his personal little piece of the socialist pie. Here, the president hosts the world's visiting political leaders. His luxurious island kingdom becomes a meeting point for crowned heads of state and international celebrities. He lived a life almost of celebrity at a time when leaders weren't celebrities. He had a Hollywood stars around and music and theater and his wife, his wife was glamorous and he was a, a bon vivant. He, had, he, he seemed to love life. He forms a special friendship with the American film diva Elizabeth Taylor. Tito even wins over her then husband for a film project. Hollywood star Richard Burton stars in a war drama in the beginning of the 1970s as a heroic partisan leader in World War II. The film makes Tito's star shine even brighter. It also pushes his successful country farther into the spotlight. And the Yugoslavians were also proud of that, that the world saw what Yugoslavia had accomplished and that they had a leader who impressed the world and was known everywhere. 
When Tito travels for state visits, he mostly does so with his huge luxury yacht, the Galib, the Seagull. This official state ship is his second seat of government and the dictator's trademark. The Yugoslavian yacht Galib in the harbor of Suez. Marshal Tito trifft zu einem offiziellen Besuch des ägyptischen Staates ein. Today, the ship is docked in the port of Rijeka. For over 10 years, Marko Eterovic was machinist on the Galib. Tito covered 90,000 sea miles with it, supposedly not least because of his fear of flying. The crew worships their president, who even visits the machine rooms from time to time. He was really approachable. He was a soldier, and even when he was in his 80s, he still stood tall. He walked a little bit slower, but was always elegant and upright, like a soldier. He never lost that. The boat increasingly becomes Tito's place of retreat. On board the Galeb, nothing suggests his country is getting off course. The saloon, a big stage for society events, but often also private refuge. Over there was the cinema, where he watched old movies. There was a dance floor and a piano that he played sometimes when he was alone and had time for it. For the first time, Eterovich enters areas of the ship that he wouldn't be allowed to step foot in while he worked there, such as Tito's bedroom with access to his own terrace. That was his spot, and in summary, spent a lot of time there. The deck would be covered in canvases and was his most intimate place. Nobody was allowed to bother him there. During the Yugoslavia wars, the ship was anchored in Montenegro and plundered. It was later expensively restored by a Greek ship owner. Today, the Galeb again belongs to the Croatian authorities and has been declared national heritage. For Marko Eterovic, the yacht is still a symbol for the old, united Yugoslavia. There were members of all the republics of the time in the crew, from Slovenians to Macedonians. The petty officer first class, second class, they represented all the ethnic groups. And everybody was equally important. Everybody had their tasks. Tito's ship represents a fleeting harmony. In foreign policy, Yugoslavia has a good reputation, and the citizens appear to do rather well. But a lot of daily consumer goods are actually state-subsidized, an economic time bomb. Tito's model of socialism already begins to fall apart by the end of the 1960s. The European old industry crisis also stops Yugoslavia's upswing. It's now clear, many firms are still technologically behind and underfinanced. More and more people lose their jobs. There was a lot of poor governance, bad investments, lack of flexibility. And that robbed the development dynamics and strength from the Yugoslavian economic system. More than 800,000 Yugoslavians leave their home country by 1975 and move to Western Europe as guest workers, the majority to Germany. Most of them are from Serbia. Currency transfers hide domestic economic problems for a while. At times, foreign transfers cover more than 90% of Yugoslavia's trade deficit. At home, the fundamental flaws of Tito's system of co-determination become clear. 
The problem with self-management was that basically it gave the power to the workers to determine what to do with the factory's budget. And what the workers did once self-management was introduced was they just kept voting themselves pay rises. There's a prosperity gap. Slovenians and Croatians have to transfer a large part of their tourism income to poorer regions like Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, and Macedonia. The forced redistribution drives a wedge between the constituent republics and their citizens. Yugoslavia's supposed success story proves to be a fairy tale, and foreign debts rise rapidly. At the end of the 1960s, there are protests in Kosovo for more autonomy. In 1971, Croatia demands bigger self-determination over its income. Tito's regime sees the country's unity in danger and answers the so-called Croatian Spring with repressions. Thousands of Croats are arrested. In the 1970s, he threw leaders of whole republics out of office. He was the guarantor for balance and for a functioning coexistence. He was aware of that, and if he wasn't there anymore, the whole thing could blow up. Eventually, Tito brings himself to enact constitutional reform. The constituent republics gain more autonomy, but the desired calming effect eludes him. Das sieht so aus und hört sich so an, als wäre in Jugoslawien der Krieg ausgebrochen. In Wirklichkeit zeigen diese Aufnahmen eines der größten Zivilschutzmanöver im Lande Titos. Vielleicht hat es etwas damit zu tun, dass Tito 87 Jahre alt ist und keiner so recht weiß, was wohl mit Jugoslawien wird, wenn Tito einmal nicht mehr Staatschef sein wird. Die Bilder beweisen, dass mit allem gerechnet wird. In 1968, the country not only prepares the People's Army, but also regional armed forces. In every constituent republic, a military is ready for the emergency. Of course, the idea was that those armed forces, the territorial defenses, would block an external attack together. It was never the plan that they attack each other. But that is exactly what is about to happen in the great Yugoslavian catastrophe. Josip Broz Tito dies on the 4th of May, 1980. His body is carried in the presidential train all through Yugoslavia, from Ljubljana, via Zagreb and Belgrade. People line railway tracks by the thousands. 35 years after its creation, the multi-ethnic state loses its idol. Many people feared that neighbors would become enemies and that the future would be uncertain. Tito lies in state in parliament. Half a million people from all constituent republics come to Belgrade. They queue for hours to say goodbye. Many ask themselves, what will become of Yugoslavia? Tito went without leaving anyone in control, and nobody really knew what was going to happen. A year later, there is unrest in Kosovo. Many Albanians feel oppressed by the government in Belgrade. They no longer want to be a Serbian province, but become an autonomous constituent republic. In March 1981, riots in Pristina are brutally quashed. Since Tito's death, there's an executive committee in Belgrade with representatives from all constituent republics and provinces who become increasingly mired in internal conflicts. It's very hard to govern by national rotations, by collective presidencies, and it was a system that never really could survive. The economic crisis is becoming a threat to the state. 
gasoline is scarce. Everyday goods are rationed. Many necessities are barely affordable for Yugoslavs. Tito's country had lived beyond their means for decades. Now, foreign lenders are calling in their debts. When it came time to pay the bills in the 1980s, and that's what happened, that was when the decline happened. So coincidental with Tito's death, you had Yugoslavia's debt coming due. Unemployment soars. Inflation rises dramatically. The crisis paralyzes the entire country, with one exception. The Yugoslav Secret Service is busier than ever. It was very, very active, and it was, in a funny sort of way, the only thing which was keeping the country going for, for a few years. Jako Kekic breaks his employer's iron rule, and today speaks openly about his time as state spy. After police academy, he signs on to the secret police. His alias, the spider. Kekic works for the headquarters in Zagreb and spies on hundreds of targets who are deemed dangerous for the state. Clerics, politicians, journalists. They were so-called nationalists, people who advocate democracy and an independent state of Croatia. For about 10 years, Kekic spies on suspected enemies of Yugoslavia. He says that his only task was observation. He claims others acted with menace and violence. Kekic acted out of belief. We were all ideologically obligated to protect Yugoslavia. I myself had been a member of the League of Communists of Croatia ever since I was 16, and our task was to preserve this regime. The long arm of the secret police even reaches abroad, as far away as Munich. Robert Zagajski returns to the place where he lost his father as a 17-year-old. The exiled Croat Juro Jagaski lived with his family in Germany since the late 1970s. From here, the trained goldsmith advocated an independent Croatia, up until his mysterious death in March 1983. It is a place of memories, of sadness and many, many questions where I still ask myself why the culprits still haven't been investigated and what exactly happened that evening. In a friend's shed, his father stores propaganda material, flyers against the communist regime in Yugoslavia. Then, strangers seem to lure him to the district of Fazanengarten. In a field outside the city, they bash in his skull. The culprits are never caught. But for the family, the truth is clear. They were murderers from the Yugoslav Secret Service. In fact, between 1970 and 89, around 30 dissidents are killed in Germany, many in similar ways to Juro Zakowski. His son is convinced. Even in Tito's times, the German government tolerated such murders as a foreign policy calculation. They did seek alliances with Tito. And, as many politicians have already admitted, they turned a blind eye. I think the criminal police investigated as far as they could. Germany was one of the countries where they operated most, because especially Croatian immigration was biggest there. 
There were several of these Ustaje organizations, and those were under our permanent observation. The fact is that we, as a secret service, had a stronger control over there than in the state itself at the time. As recently as 2016, some masterminds were finally brought to justice. The former chief of the Secret Service, Josip Perkovic, is sentenced to life in prison. Across Europe, the Yugoslav Secret Service is said to have committed more than a hundred murders. Economic collapse reawakens nationalism in all Yugoslav republics. In 1986, a man emerges from obscurity onto the political stage in Belgrade, Slobodan Milosevic. His parents were Montenegrins. He self-identifies as a passionate Serb. The former industry boss and bank director becomes leader of the Communist Party of Serbia. What Milosevic had was he was smart. He understood the way the world worked. And he, I think, very early on, saw the power of nationalism. During a visit to the Serbian minority in the province of Kosovo, a scene plays out that instantly makes him famous. When some Serbs in the crowd claim that the local police, consisting mainly of Albanians, had beaten them. With some momentous comments, Milosevic pours oil on the fire. From then on, everything that Milosevic does, you can see, is uh, aimed at taking over power in Serbia and becoming the Serbian strongman. Milosevic's message, the Serbs have to rise up. Otherwise, they face cultural suppression in Kosovo, and especially in Croatia. Serbian nationalism also flares up in other regions of Yugoslavia. Hundreds of thousands of supporters follow Milosevic's speech on the historic Kosovo field, a place almost sacred for the Serbs. In the summer of 1389, the Serbian Prince Lazar opposes the Ottomans, who conquer increasingly large parts of the Balkans. He dies in battle, and the invaders are unstoppable. But for the Serbs, the Kosovo field remains a symbol for their battle against suppression. To mark the 600-year anniversary of the battle, Milosevic calls for a revolt. Danas. From this moment on, it is only two years until the big bloodshed in Yugoslavia. In Eastern Europe, the communist system breaks down in the fall of 1989. In November, the Berlin Wall falls. How long can the regime hold in Yugoslavia? Croatia is the first to demand sovereignty. During votes in May 1990, the National Conservative Party, HDZ, wins and brings their founder, Franjo Tudjman, to power. The former partisan fighter was a member of the national movement during his school years. Now, he becomes strongman of the Republic with a mandate to detach from Yugoslavia. And he's willing to go to war for it. Franjo Tuđman had a combination of the military and the mythological, the Croatian greatness, the restoration of what he saw of the dream of a Croatian state. Bosnia-Herzegovina and Slovenia also demand their independence. Yugoslavia is on the verge of falling apart. Tito's vision of a southern Slavic multi-ethnic state has failed. 
the Yugoslav identity didn't work to dissolve those identities and in many respects didn't even work to keep them all balanced and in harmony all the time. In May 1990, host team Dinamo faces Red Star Belgrade in Maksimir football stadium in Zagreb. When Vyakoslav Skriniar and his team come onto the field, Croatian and Serbian fans start fighting. A rumble began on the north side. Dinamo supporters broke through the rails of the barriers. The chaos became worse and worse. Our fans ran out onto the grass. The situation goes out of control. The Yugoslav police tries to push the Croatian fans off the field. Zagreb's team captain, Zvonimir Boban, storms a policeman and attacks him with a targeted kick. The midfield star becomes a hero of the Croatian resistance against the Belgrade-based federation. After that, nothing is the same. In that moment, the separation between Croatia and Yugoslavia began. We then played one last season in the Yugoslav League, even though the situation became more and more crazy. Yugoslavia kept existing for another year, then it fell apart. An angry crowd revolts against the Serbian dominant state power. The Yugoslav tragedy runs its course. The game never starts. And to this day, the 13th of May, 1990, is considered a fateful day for many people. A year later, Yugoslavia is in flames. <laughs>